Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, thank the Ministry of Education and Skills Development for hosting this event and Africa Brains for organizing uh, this conference. And uh, it's indeed a privilege to participate in this conference as well. Um, today on this panel, we wish to look at education management from the point of view of the ministries and looking at how proper information management systems can assist those ministries in their policies for basic education, as well as addressing the increasing number of programs that uh, must be implemented as we move from the paradigm of access to one of quality. Um, so we would appreciate uh, our honorable members, honor honorable ministers and secretaries to uh, discuss this in the context of early learning and the issues around dealing with rural communities as well. Uh, my first question is um, to all of the panel members. Uh, the universal primary education completion is an essential development goal. And can we start by each of you summarizing what your policies are with respect to enhancing education management, especially dealing with the consistency of distribution of resources to schools and teachers. Um, Honorable Professor Wilombe, would you like to start? Thank you, Chair. May I first join the others who have paid tribute to our host, the government of Botswana, to the organizers and the sponsors for the wonderful welcome and hospitality that we continue to enjoy, and also to the many countries that have come to participate and give us this uh, enriched knowledge about Innovation Africa 2013. Well, in response to the question, um, first I have to give a little bit uh, information about Zambia. We are three times the size of the British Isles and uh, we are landlocked, uh, surrounded by nine countries. Um, at the independence in 1964, there were about 2.5 million people. 49 years down the line, uh, that's the next 24. October will be 49 years independent. We are close to 14 million. Um, education provision in Zambia is guided by policy as well as the developmental documentations, um, particularly the education policy of 1996, the 60th National Development plan, which uh, runs from 2011 to 2015, and the party manifesto, including the vision uh, 2030. Uh, the party manifesto is for the party that is in government. And all these uh, embrace the Millennium Development Goals, particularly goal number two, on universal primary education. My government came into power um, in 2011 and has put measures in place to enhance education management, especially the distribution of resources to schools and teachers. Uh, what we have done up to this point is that uh, we have reintroduced um, free education, free and compulsory education 
from grade one to grade 12. Um, to make this a reality, we have uh, increased also adequate budgetary allocation on education to make it really uh, happen and further cater for appropriate uh, expansion and upgrading of infrastructure uh, and the teacher resources. Uh, to this effect, uh, we have a budgetary allocation that has increased from 15% in 2011 to 20.5% in 2014. We are also upgrading primary schools that cater for grade one to grade four to full-fledged uh, primary schools, that's uh, providing grade one to grade seven. We are also upgrading community schools, which are many, many to full-fledged primary schools, providing also grade one to grade 12, I mean, to grade seven. We are also providing inclusive uh, education for children who are mild or moderately uh, with a disability. And for these, we are integrating in mainstream uh, education schools. Uh, for those that uh, cannot be integrated, we are providing special uh, education for them. We have also introduced uh, school feeding programs, particularly in rural areas, uh, to uh, promote health among the children and to retain them, uh, to make them continue with their schools. We are also providing uh, in-service uh, scholarships for teachers to upgrade those that are non-degree holders or they are diploma holders to degree level. Uh, we have also uh, encouraged stakeholder participation in the establishment of these uh, schools, including universities. We are rehabilitating uh, existing teacher, uh, teacher's houses and constructing appropriate uh, models of houses for teachers in rural areas. Um, government provides increased monitoring of standards uh, through, in both public and private institutions through a professional inspectorate. Um, not only that, we also are <clears throat> providing competitive and attractive emoluments to teachers in order to retain them and stem the brain drain. We've had this since independence. We train a lot of teachers, but because of poor salaries and conditions of service, they migrated to our neighbors. We are also, in order to provide additional incentives, we are providing uh, some sort of hardship allowances for those that uh, are in the rural areas, uh, double class allowances, extra duty allowances, and other incentives to teachers. Uh, we are in the process, and uh, we have actually reviewed the Education Act of 1966 in order to harmonize and bring it in line with the current demands. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for that um, very thorough um, uh, summary and uh, clearly a lot of programs that need to be managed. Um, um, Director Kateba, could you just uh, briefly give us a summary as well of the, um, your policies with respect to educational management and the distribution of resources and teachers? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to <coughs> share two <coughs> Excuse me. Two policies that Uganda has in place for distribution 
of resources to schools and teachers. Uh, one of the uh, policies is the decentralized policy. Uh, in Uganda, the primary education system is fully decentralized. And this means that people at the grassroots are in charge of the schools. The recruitment of teachers and uh, support staff is managed by the district education service commissions. Uh, they are the ones who interview the teachers and deploy them, uh, similar to the support staff. Uh, another policy that we have uh, is the distribution of funds through straight through policy. Uh, under this policy, the capitation grants are released by Ministry of Finance straight through to school accounts. Uh, each school has a, a bank account where the salary is uh, released. And then the teacher, the head teacher, is in charge of utilizing the fund uh, following guidelines which are provided by Ministry of Education. Uh, that head teacher gives accountability and the accountability is approved by school management committees. And then it is <coughs> submitted to the chief administrative officer at the district who uh, looks at the accountability and gives a certificate of accountability. Uh, similarly, uh, teachers' salaries are released straight through to the teachers' accounts. This uh, enables the teachers to get their salaries in time without going through the district accounts. The salaries are released by public service and it goes to the individual accounts of the teachers. The same happens to uh, retirement packages and pensions for the retirees. Uh, these also go straight to the individual accounts. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director. Um, Minister DeCora, did you care to comment, please? Thank you, Chair. The, I want to join the colleagues who have expressed their gratitude for the hospitality of our Diamond Minister of Education, the host. We have been well looked after and we cherish the opportunity to be here. The resource distribution and allocation in Zimbabwe in some way bears um, some resemblance to the experience that uh, Zambia has just described. But um, in Zimbabwe, in 1980, when we assumed our independence, the independence government did invoke a structure that has become a permanent feature of our education system to date, which is the institutionalization of parent community participation in the education of their children through the school development committees, whose task is principally to mobilize resources to impact on the learning and teaching that goes on in the schools. That's one major source of a resource which impacts on what goes on in our system. Second, we have categorization of schools. Um, those schools that are located in the low density areas, in the uh, urban areas, 
and the schools located in the high density or highly dense uh, uh, populated areas in the urban areas. They occupy another category. And then, of course, the rural schools. Um, they occupy yet another uh, threshold. So there are three different categories there. And this distribution is also matched with the fact of whether a teachers are deployed in a rural setting, consequently, therefore, having certain entitlements for rural allowances and so on. And if they are in the urban areas, again, the SDCs of late have had some impact in their participation there by contributing some uh, incentive um, to the teachers. At a central level, government looks to the enrollment of each school and allocates a certain amount of money per child, per capita grants as they are called, to follow the child's um, trajectory throughout that, that given year. We have altogether something in the order of 8,500 school institutions. Of those, the majority are the primary schools. And the population in those schools is in the order of 4.6 million young people. And that is not everybody. In other words, there is a category below the grade one of learners. We call them the early childhood um, development modules A, whose uptake is at four years, and early childhood development module B, whose uptake is at five years. And then grade one starts at, grade, uh, at, at uh, age six. In the mandate that we have just assumed, you had our continuity director refer to me as the new minister. In the mandate that we have just assumed, we are looking at those two modules to say that they cannot be left simply to the ability of the parent communities. Government must come in. And obviously, that has implication for resource mobilization. And one looks to how technology perhaps can mediate in that task. Because as we speak now, it is not unusual in a rural schools to find a teacher-pupil ratio of one to 60. And one would like to say it's a huge possibility, a huge opportunity for technologies to impact in that process of teaching and learning. We also have a new constitution that has just come into operation in our country. And I'll just cite two aspects of that new constitution, and then perhaps I can come back to it if the subsequent questions make it necessary. But two aspects. One, the inclusion of indigenous languages. Previously, there were three languages that were acknowledged in our system, two national languages and an official language. The new constitution makes reference to 16 languages. And therefore, we must now begin to match district to a language, and then to say, what is the implication for education at the infant school level? And how can we employ technologies to quicken, to hasten the interrogation of those languages and indeed developing a, lex a lexicography that could be made available to teachers in the process? The second aspect is, of course, the emphasis on equity and access to education for all our people. And it's a huge challenge, but we think that uh, uh, given a good balance and mix of uh, technologies and the professional uh, crop of uh, personnel that we have in the system, we should be able to find opportunities that we can open and increase the uptake 
and access to education in Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Um, and Ms. Nkwa. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to see so many of you here in Botswana, and we are very happy to be the hosts. And we hope you'll enjoy what our beautiful country has to offer. And we will indeed learn from all the presentations and discussions. Uh, coming back to the topic at hand, uh, I want to start by highlighting the fact that in Botswana, our education is driven by the national vision for being an educated and informed nation. And our mandate as the Ministry of Education and Skills Development is to educate this nation as well as to skill it so as to provide the necessary human resource to drive this economy and the global economy. Uh, at primary level, education is a shared responsibility between the two ministries of education and skills development and the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. The Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development is responsible for the infrastructure development, what we call the hardware, uh, building of schools, providing furniture, uh, providing the necessary feeding, and all the related equipment. Whilst the Ministry of Education is responsible for the curriculum and the delivery of the curriculum, including the teaching and learning that goes into schools. And we have structures in place that coordinate the delivery between the two ministries. Education in our country is premised on four fundamental pillars. That is access. Each and every child of school going age uh, must have access to education. At the moment, at primary education, our enrollment rates is around 95%, 94-95%. We acknowledge that we have the missing 5%, and we are working very hard to identify and incentivize the missing 5% to join uh, the school system. We are also driven by the need for equity in terms of the infrastructure, the resources that we have in our schools. The type of school that you'll find in Khaboroni, you'll find it in any other village. The only difference may be in terms of population size and uh, maybe the other developments that may not have been rolled out. But in terms of the quality of teachers, the same qualified teachers that you find in Khaboroni, you'll find in any other place. Uh, this also includes the resources that we provide because we are driven by the philosophy that each and every child has a right to learn and to access the requisite resources for a conducive learning environment. We are also uh, informed by the need for relevance. Our education has to be relevant to our needs as a country and to the global economy so that uh, in terms of attainment and competences, they must attain the required competences at the different levels as they progress. And most importantly, quality comparable to international standards. We are continuously uh, benchmarking and comparing ourselves uh, with the international community using the different instruments and surveys as provided by the international organizations that we are members of, such as UNESCO and others. Uh, we 
also provide a number of support initiatives in order to create a conducive learning environment. As we speak now, we have a, an initiative that we call Back to School. We recognize that there are young people who may have missed school for one reason or another, or may have dropped out of school. We are encouraging them to go back to school. We are continuously registering them and finding them places so that they can rejoin the education system and have another opportunity to learn and to get a higher qualification as well as to be skilled. We also have initiatives such as Adopt a School, where we are inviting the community, where we are inviting citizens to adopt schools so that they can be part of the education system. And I want to say this has been a very successful initiative because different companies from the private sector, different individuals, different communities have adopted schools and are making various contributions. Uh, some of the contributions may include maybe buying computers for a school or buying uniforms for children or even coming in and giving motivational talks. We also have what we call mentors, where we have people who are identified as having made it, uh, going into schools to mentor and to motivate young people to be motivated to learn. We also have several other ongoing initiatives that are yielding results. And most importantly, we have what we call the affirmative action, so that our vulnerable communities, uh, people who may have been disadvantaged uh, for one reason or another, such as orphans, such as our people in remote areas, can have access to schools and we can provide several uh, things that motivate them to want to go back to school, such as making sure that they have uniforms, such as making sure that there is food. And in our remote area communities, we also have hostels, so that our children who stay in farms and in small settlements can be accommodated in hostels and be provided with a conducive learning environment for learning. And in the hostels, we provide what we call house mothers so that we can create a home environment when these children go out of school. We also operate a decentralized system of uh, education service delivery. At the district level, at local government, we have what we call uh, council secretaries and district councils. These are the people that oversee the infrastructure development and maintenance in our schools. Within the Ministry of Education, we have what we call regional directors. They are responsible for the coordination and delivery of education at a regional level. Uh, we are also embarking on a number of initiatives as a way of improving delivery within the education system. We are talking early childhood. We recognize as a country and as the Ministry of Education that we are not at the level where we would like to be when it comes to uh, delivery on early childhood. But a number of initiatives have been put in place this includes standard one orientation across all public schools. Uh, this is a six-week program that prepares those who are going to be joining standard one the following year to come into our schools and to be oriented. We have also started a pilot program on reception classes. We started it uh, last year uh, in the Kalahadi district, it's one of our remote areas where we piloted it in six schools and it's been very successful. 
in 2014, we are rolling the provision of reception classes to 114 schools across the country in all regions. Our target is that by 2015, all our public schools will have access to pre-primary as a major requirement for improving learning and also preparedness uh, for school. <clears throat> These are some of the initiatives that we have. Uh, I'll pause here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, given the, the policies, the broad policies that you've just outlined, um, there is a huge need for information related to the programs that are being implemented associated with these policies. Um, can each of you give a summary of the activities that you uh, have for data collection in turn, at the school level, um, student and teacher data, um, as well as information relating to the issues of access and equity, and to outline the, the differences between what you're doing to, for, from a data collection perspective in the rural areas uh, in, in comparison to what is taking place in urban areas as well. Um, we could start with uh, Director Kateba. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Uganda is doing a lot uh, to establish uh, systems of uh, collecting information from uh, schools to headquarters. And as I have said, uh, connectivity is not yet uh, established. But we have started small. And uh, we are hoping that uh, as time goes on, we will be able to cover the whole country. Um, when we look at the connectivity with the schools, uh, we look at uh, the number of schools that exist in the country. Uh, Uganda is one of the countries in Africa with the highest population growth. And this translates into uh, big numbers of schools, and which means a lot of funding is required to support all the schools. Um, when we talk of connectivity, we look at how do we get to the schools? And to get to the schools, some of the schools are in far to reach areas. Uh, in fact, we refer to them not only as hard to reach, but also hard to stay. Uh, people cannot manage to stay there. The conditions are harsh. So, what the government has decided to do was to take a very tough decision. And that was, unfortunately, to store a salary increase to teachers and relocate funds to the transport sector. The 20% increase which had been uh, promised to teachers was stayed. And the money was put in the transport sector. Uh, the government believes that uh, this will be more sustainable in the long run than increasing the salary of teachers. It will bring schools in connectivity, in transport-wise, uh, transport 
with the rural areas and therefore will make, uh, make it easy for the government to develop the schools. Uh, we also uh, took a decision to carry out rural electrification because we cannot talk of uh, connectivity when there is no power in the rural areas. So the government has taken on a program which will see uh, the power lines extended uh, from currently a distance of 1,700 kilometers to a distance of 3,400 kilometers. And this is a, a program which will cover four years. Uh, at the same time, uh, power projects, six power projects are being are uh, implemented concurrently. And it is believed that when all this is done, uh, then we will be able to reduce the digital divide which is currently existing between uh, schools uh, in the rural areas and those in the urban areas and we will improve the connectivity and access to digital information in our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Director. And I'm aware that um, in Uganda you have the current uh, procedure of collecting data using the annual school census, uh, where you collect information once a year, which mm -hmm. is then linked to the management information systems for monitoring and evaluation. And while you were talking about connectivity, you all have also implemented some innovative programs whereby you're using cell phone and smartphone in the rural areas, which enable data to be collected using cell phones where there isn't connectivity, and sending that information into your monitoring and evaluation systems at the district and national mm -hmm. level. So um, thank you for addressing the issue with respect to connectivity. And uh, um, Honorable Minister uh, uh, from Zimbabwe. Thank you. Um, I will just contextualize the response to the question you, you raise. That um, the first aspect is to say what has been the traditional method of collecting data from our schools. It's on hard copy, generated at the beginning of every term, and there are three terms to the year and headmasters, school heads, religiously perform this task. Now, since 1999, we've heard a program that um, was initiated by the head of state to computerize schools. And to date, we have over a thousand schools that have computers. While the head of state donated an initial crop of 10 to 20 computers per school, and he covered about 870 of them, the structures that I referred to earlier, the school development committees, have come into their own to make these the additional purchases, leading to the over 1,000 schools that have that access now. It's true that we have the highest illiteracy rate in Africa. It's not a secret at all. But it's built on the foundations that are supported by the parent communities of the schools. To that extent, in the last few years, a decision was taken to place the collection tool for data from schools to place it in an e-form. And hence, the beginnings 
of the EMIS program in Zimbabwe. We are hoping that by end of this year, not only will we have reached the 10 provinces, but we will have also reached four of the 73 districts. In other words, there is still some work to go, but uh, obviously with the schools already familiar with um, computers, that extension should be very rapid in the new year, especially as we look to uh, partners to um, work with and cascade the, the hardware side of that. So that data now is being collected through the electronic means for now. Thank you. Honorable Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, like um, my colleague did say from Zimbabwe, we share similar backgrounds, having been under the same colonial power. And um, similarly for us, uh, we consider that uh, there is no substitute for timely and accurate collection of reliable data. This is for a proper decision-making process. And for this reason, there is need to have policies that uh, guide you, plans and uh, investment in, in data collection, analysis and dissemination is important. My ministry conducts an annual school census where data for schools, students and teachers is collected. The collection of data from the schools, the data entry and processing by uh, districts, staff, as well as uh, national dissemination are guided by well-planned and coordinated plans to ensure that data is uniform, comparable, and has integrity. This is also done in line with the SADIC EMIS norms and standards. My ministry <coughs> also has an EMIS plan of action that acts as a one-stop uh, document that comprises strategies and activities that the Ministry of Education has put in place uh, to address the highlights from the external evaluations and data quality as assessment framework. Um, known as DQAF, Report of Our Emmys uh, uh, Additions. Additionally, the plan of action has factored in issues related to sustainability as well as Emmys norms and standards. My Thank ministry you. is also uh, forming data management committees uh, like our uh, neighbors have had at all levels to spearhead the activities related to data harmonization and the timeliness of uh, data. It is emphasized through this that uh, once the DMCs have been formed at all levels, they will cover all aspects of EMIS, including the following. Overseeing implementation of a focused training in computer literacy basic analytical skills, advanced programming, systems maintenance or analysis, etc., which are necessary for ease rollout and uh, sustainability. Thank you, Minister. And briefly, uh, Ms. Kwa. Thank you very much. Uh, data collection and availability of data is indeed a challenge for most of our countries. And I'm happy to inform you that uh, the Ministry of Education is uh, undertaking a major reform that is designed to transform the education sector. What we call 
uh, the education uh, training sector strategic plan. Uh, it's looking at the whole education sector from pre-primary up to tertiary. And one of the subsectors that we are looking at is the subsector on information management, EMIS, because indeed the collation, collection and collation of education statistics is a challenge for us. And uh, we collect statistics at three levels, at the institutional level, at the district level, and at national level. Uh, we also recognize the challenges that we have because predominantly uh, we have just been asking people to submit information, submit, submit, to a, a situation where there has been information fatigue. And what our strategy going forward is to empower uh, our stakeholders right from institutions that the information that they collect, be it the manual information or the electronic information, they can actually use it to empower themselves at institutional level. They can use it to share uh, information with their communities, with their PTAs, uh, with their stakeholders at that institutional level. And at the district level, it can inform the district performance it can also inform the resources available at district level for purposes of planning and rationalization. <clears throat> at the national level, we need uh, to have a holistic and comprehensive appreciation of the information that we need, the data that we need, the records that we need, so as to assess our performance as a country, so as to plan. We are at a stage where not all our schools are computerized, but we also recognize that for us to have adequate information, it doesn't necessarily mean that we all have to be computerized. There are so many strategies that we can use, such as using basic Excel that we are now using in data collection, such as capacity building so that we build the capacity of our data collectors right from the institutional level up to the national level. We are also looking at strategies of how we can best package and use that information for decision making. As we develop the sector plan, we recognize that we need information. We need timely information so as to make informed decisions. And we are working on coming up with strategies in terms of how best uh, to strengthen our information uh, collection systems. And we are already there. At primary school, we are at 92%. And at secondary schools, we are, at seven, uh, we are also at 90%. At the tertiary level, we are up to date. At the vocational sector, we are also still collating, but we are on the 2012-2011 statistics. So we are making progress, and we are confident that with the conclusion of the sector plan, we'll have a holistic plan. We'd like to computerize. We are looking at options in terms of the EMI systems available for us to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kwan. And I can see that on that note, it's time to wind up the session. Um, on behalf of Agile Learning, I'd like to thank the members of the panel uh, for their comments uh, regarding the ways their ministries are dealing with the issue of data collection. Um, it would have been great to have had more time to talk more about the information management systems you actually have at this time, um, which is of uh, critical interest to everyone here, including ourselves, as we develop and localize national and decentralized EMIS systems and have implemented them in sub-Saharan Africa in several countries. Uh, it continues to be a privilege for us to work with ministries in addressing their critical task of having access to the information and using the information for decision making. And on behalf of African Brains and Agile Learning, we'd like to thank you for attending this panel session and officially close the session. And thanks again to the distinguished panel for their contribution. <laughs>